Welcome to wherever you are tuning in from around the world. I'm Michael Dixon, coming to you live from Israel, and this is Stand With Us Connect. I hope you're well, and I hope your family is doing well. We've had an average of 10,000 people joining us every night, uh, every day, that we've run these Stand With Us Connect webinars since we began them. So thank you very much for joining us. As you know, Passover is coming up. You can still get your Stand With Us Haggadah. It may not ship to you on time for Seder night, but you will get it. Uh, at least you'll have it for next year. So look at that at standwithus.com slash shop. And don't forget, you can see the full program of Stand With Us programs at standwithus.com slash connect or standwithusconnect.com to see our upcoming programs. We also have a live virtual Seder that's available for you on all of our social media and Stand With Us Connect. And if you love the work of Stand With Us fighting anti-Semitism and supporting Israel around the world, you can support our work at standwithus.com slash donate. Thank you again for joining us from wherever you are. Our guest today is an inspirational faith leader. He's the former British chief rabbi, an inspiring figure for Jews and so many others. He's a moral voice in our world. He's the author of over 30 books. He's been awarded 18 honorary doctorates and has won many accolades, including the Jerusalem Prize, the Templeton Prize, and the Stand With Us Beacon of Light Award. Joining us live from London, I'm honored to welcome Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Thank you for being with us. Well, Mike, Michael, it's great to be with you. Um, let me first of all thank every single one of the people who are connected with Stand With Us for their incredible work throughout the years, important, vital work, and every one of you is a hero. Thank you, Michael, and all your team who are connecting us with one another across the world. I think the Almighty sent social media down just for something like this, and Jews know how to connect. So it's wonderful to be with you and to wish all of you, every one of you tuning in, a good Pesach, maybe not a super happy one, but at least a memorable one, one we will talk about for the rest of our lives. Absolutely, and we speak at a time when so many people around the globe are in different forms of pain. It's a phenomenon that's touching everybody. So as we all face this crisis, what brings you comfort and solace? Well, first of all, the obvious negatives. I mean, this is the biggest thing that has happened since World War II. And at least it isn't a war. And many of us had been fearing uh, a war at various times, whether it was the Cuban Missile Crisis or it was stuff in the Middle East, or it was stuff following the trauma of 9-11. Uh, Elaine and I and our kids, who were then really quite young, were in uh, Jerusalem for the whole of the first Gulf War. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was not unlike this. We all had our gas masks and there were 39 Scud missiles raining down and we did not know which, whether the next one would contain chemical or biological weapons. So those were really, really fearful. Now, this is fearful at every level, economic, physical, psychological, social, but at least it's not war. And at least humanity isn't divided into our lot and the enemy. On this, we are a single humanity facing the same challenge. So I think, terrible though it is, uh, it could have been a whole lot worse. There'll be many people who will be depressed by the situation, as you mentioned. Uh, many will have suffered a bereavement of someone close, uh, surely no one is completely untouched by, as you said, this universal pandemic. How do you, as a rabbi, counsel people to see the light in what feels like a very dark situation in doing? Well, number one, bereavement is a kind of darkness whenever it happens. It's really, really tough. I mean, it took me, it takes most people a year to get over a bereavement. That's what Jewish laws of mourning are about. And you can't suddenly switch a light on and pretend it hasn't happened. Bereavement is deep pain. The trouble is that bereavements are happening without the comfort of family and friends being with you at the funeral and being able to visit you at Shiva. Obviously, all sorts of uh, electronic devices, Zoom, you know, whoever heard of Zoom more than a month ago, you know, suddenly, you know, funerals are being live streamed, Shiva visits are being paid through Zoom and other things. So people who are bereaved still know that the community and their wider family is with them. But the truth is, if there is one comfort 
it's that everyone realizes that they are not alone in being alone. You've got a best-selling book right now in the UK. It's out in the United States in September. It's called Morality. How does it relate to the current situation we find ourselves in? Well, <clears throat> embarrassingly, it turns out to be the most topical book I could possibly have written. And obviously, I was not anticipating this. I've been arguing that increasingly over the last few decades, we've had too much I and too little we, too much pursuit of self-interest, too little concern with the common good. And what's happened, and everyone has noticed this, is that we've had these two very distinct behaviors. Crisis brings out the worst in people and the best in people. And the worst happens when people focus on the I. You know, they panic by, they hoard, they stockpile, they flout social distancing rules or self-imposed isolation rules. And those things are terrible and they come from disregarding the common good. On the other hand, we've had a, a, a rise in good neighborliness, the like of which I've never seen before. You know, every street around here has its own WhatsApp group. So that a guy who's going shopping can WhatsApp all his neighbors saying, I'm going shopping, does anyone need anything? I can't tell you how many neighbors we have that we never knew we had who want to help. Every shul has become a kind of social center for doing this kind of thing, doing the Pesach shopping for everyone, you know. And uh, the thing that really hit me, because it was so unexpected, is that my little eight-year-old granddaughter, of her own accord two weeks ago, following the rules of distance, social distancing, went through to every house in her street, knocking on the door and saying, we live at number 12. If you need anything, just knock on our door. And nobody told her to. It was just great. So, you know, people have discovered the we and how good it is and the I and how bad it is. And I do hope that what will come out of all of this in the, in, in, in the full, uh, in the long run, will be a stronger sense of social connectedness, a stronger sense of altruism, stronger sense of neighborliness, which is really what I wrote my book in order to try and achieve. We're coming up to Passover, to pass up the Festival of Freedom. We're approaching Seder night when families and friends come together in normal times. Now in normal times, Jewish life is the opposite of social distancing. Uh, so with so much of Jewish life focused on coming together, how should we approach Passover this year when we can't be with our family or with our community? Well, I'm sure you do it with a sense of humor. I'm sure you've seen the thing that was going on the rounds today. You know, the sages at B'nai Brak sitting around <laughs> discussing the Pesach and the police come in and say, forbidden. <laughs> you know, poor old Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tav and, you know, uh, they weren't keeping the social distance stuff. They couldn't so, stay for the Shema. Pardon? They couldn't stay for the Shema. They couldn't stay for the Shema. They broke it up long before the Shema. So, uh, but uh, it seems to me that some creative things are being done. I mean, first of all, I'm sure you know Rabbi Benny Lau is doing an online seder with uh, singer Ehud Banai, which is going to be broadcast on television, on a television channel that won't be broadcasting anything else. So you can leave it on all the way through, and all you'll do is get the Seder survey. We can't do that in, in Chutzlaretz, but uh, Benny Lau is doing that. There is a fabulous project, I'm sure you're aware of, in Israel, uh, especially in Yerushalayim, called Am Echad B'Shulchan Echad. At 8.30 on Wednesday evening, everyone is going out on their balconies so that the elderly people who are alone can hear the five-year-old and four-year-old kids sing Maneshtana. So the whole of Yerushalayim is becoming one family. And this is something that never happened before. So I think that's really, really good. I, Elaine and I will be on our own. But then a few years ago, you know, our kids bought us one of those little electronic picture frames, you know, the kind. Sure. And so, you know, now every on Friday night when we're making Kiddush, we stand by the picture frame and we see all our grandchildren. It's beautiful. So you can do all this stuff. And uh, if you're really, really in, in the depths of despair, then you have to watch 
Natan Sharansky's little video of how he survived nine years in the KGB prison, you know, and four and a half of them in solitary confinement. And he really managed to, to put together the mental disciplines to do it. And he's got a lovely YouTube video. But the truth is that maybe we're being reminded of something we've forgotten about, you know. Pesach used to be, we're in Egypt, and we're slaves, and this is terrible, and we're eating the blood of affliction and the bitter herbs of slavery. I asked a rabbi in Los Angeles who was conducting a seder in Hawaii, and I said, in Hawaii, where is the affliction? He said, that comes when they give you the bill. But, you know, I mean, here we are in the middle of affliction. And Pesach is telling us that there is a journey from the matzah and the mara to the four cups of wine of freedom. We can move from darkness to light, from confinement to, to liberation. So Pesach is a journey of hope. And this particular Pesach, although it may be a little lonely, will be very vivid. And I think, you know, give us an experience that uh, we, we're not going to forget. Absolutely. Um, I'll remind our viewers that you can send in your questions. We'll be happy to put them to Rabbi Sachs as much as we can, given our time. Um, Rabbi Sachs, this week marked what could be a turning point in the UK as Jeremy Corbyn ended his term as British Labour leader. Now, during that time, anti-Semitic attack after attack was uncovered in the party that he led. What are your reflections on this and on modern anti-Semitism? Well, I'll tell you something. It's very interesting. Uh, there was Labour leader called Harold Wilson, who won four general elections. There was a Labour leader called Tony Blair, who won three general elections. There was a Labour leader called Gordon Brown, who was the last Labour Prime Minister. All three of those were true friends of the Jewish people and true friends of the State of Israel. And they're the only people who won an election. So I hope that Labour has finally worked out that if you want to win an election, try, however hard it is, to be friendly to Jews and respectful of the Jewish state. Because otherwise, you're going to be in complete exile forever. That is not because the whole world is philo-Semitic. But it is because anyone who can't be trusted to rid his party of anti-Semitism cannot be trusted with the destinies of our nation. And I think Sakir, uh, Sakir Starmer has, has, has made this absolutely clear straight away. Almost the first thing he said is we have to rid the party of the taint of anti-Semitism. We have to remove it, he said, by its roots. He spent a, sent a lovely message to the Jewish community comforting them for some of the casualties of, of, of the uh, pandemic. Um, he's indicated that he's going to take a completely different direction. And that's going to be very good news for us, for the Labour Party and for Britain. And speaking about anti-Semitism, I remember at our Stand With Us UK gala in London a couple of years ago, you powerfully said, uh, and this is relevant as we come up to Passover, to be free is to let go of hate. To be free is to let go of hate. How should both we and our enemies internalize that message? <clears throat> I was saying this because Moshe Rabbeinu, at the end of his life, in Devarim chapter 23, says, Lot ta'ev mitzri. Don't despise an Egyptian. Ki ger ha'yita ba'artso. Because you were a stranger in his land. I mean, that's an incredible thing to say. I mean, we were a stranger in his land. They did not put us up in the Cairo Hilton. They, they persecuted us. They enslaved us. They killed our male children. And yet Moshe Rabbeinu says, don't hate them, because if you do, you'll still be slaves, not physically, but psychologically. You will not have let go of the past, and the past will not have let go of you. And Jews are not good haters. You know, the only people we really hate are the Amalekites who haven't got a clue who they are. And actually, the only Amalekite we can really think of is Homon and Purim, and all we do is make a loud noise, you know. There's nothing nasty about it. So somehow or other, we've stayed, relatively speaking, very free of hate. 
And the result is that we are not held captive by the bad things that have happened in our past. When the fact that a mere three years after the liberation of Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, the Jewish people could get up in the form of David Ben-Gurion and play, proclaim the state of Israel, meant that Jews were looking forward, they weren't looking back. Hate always involves looking back. And the end result is you are held captive by the past and you would never be free. Rabbi Sachs, I want to let you know we have some uh, greetings from uh, Sultan Mashakba, who's saying Shalom from Jordan. Uh, Priya Rayo is in Mumbai, India, watching us. Heinz Adam is uh, saying Shalom from Santiago in Chile. Uh, Camilo de Molino is in Colombia. Uh, Singa David is in Budapest. Mandy Sher in South Africa. Angela Brown in Brussels, uh, just sending their greetings from around the world. Yeah, um, greetings to them. I've just traveled further in one minute than I have in the rest of my life. <laughs> You and all of us. Um, one of the recurrent themes in modern anti-Semitic attacks are that Israel, and uniquely, we're talking about the nations of the world right now, uniquely among the world's 193 nations, Israel alone is seen as illegitimate. So is anti-Zionism, in your view, the new anti-Semitism? Yeah, I mean, the reason we have a coronavirus pandemic is because viruses mutate. The body has this incredible, sophisticated mechanism called the immune system. And it recognizes viruses and it sets up the defenses against them. And the only way a virus can survive, really, and succeed is to mutate so that the immune system no longer recognizes that virus because it never saw that virus before. And the same is true of hatred, especially of anti-Semitism. So in the Middle Ages, Jews were hated for their religion. In the 19th, late 19th and early 20th century, they were hated for their race. Today, they're hated for their nation state, the state of Israel. Each one of those mutations, because you couldn't in the 19th century hate Jews because of their religion. The 19th century was an age of scientific rationality. Religion just didn't have any street cred anymore as a reason to hate somebody. But race was regarded as something that could be studied scientifically. After the Holocaust, you can't hate somebody because of their race. So we got hated for our nation state. What is common to all three, religion, race, and nation state, is that they are the collective embodiment of the Jewish people. So in the Middle Ages, we were a religious community. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, lots and lots of Jews were quite secular in Vienna, in Berlin, in Paris. So they were no longer really a religious community. They were an ethnic community. Today, the collective embodiment of the Jewish people is the state of Israel. All the rest of us are scattered minorities. Israel is the only place where Jews are a majority, where Jews have the ability to create their own society and their own culture. It's the only place that they speak the Jewish language. So the collective embodiment of Jews has changed. Anti-Semitism has changed. But today, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And the reason is that of all countries whose legitimacy cannot be doubted, it's the state of Israel. It was brought into being by a two-thirds vote of the United Nations on the 29th of November, 1947. I mean, you couldn't have a more obvious form of legitimacy than that, which had been preceded by the Balfour Declaration, which had been in, in, uh, endorsed by the League of Nations in 1922. So you have to rewrite history to delegitimate the state of Israel. Rabbi Sachs, in a few weeks, we will celebrate the 72nd Independence Day, Yom Ha'atzma'ut. And I know that, I hope I'm not giving anything away to our audience here. I know that you also recently celebrated the same birthday, uh, yes. so Mazal Tov. Uh, 72 years since the Jewish state was reborn. You've called Israel the home of hope. Why so? Because of two very moving moments, many centuries apart. There is a prophecy in the 37th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, where the prophet sees Israel as a valley of dry bones. 
And I find that the most haunting Holocaust literature I know, despite the fact that it was written 26 centuries before the Holocaust. But that's what the British saw when they liberated Bergen-Belsen on the 15th of April, 1945, a valley of dry bones. And God says to the prophet, the people say, Avdatik Vatenu, our hope is lost. And God says, but it isn't lost. I will lift you out of your graves and take you to the land of Israel. And I thought, what an image of what actually happened in the 20th century. And then, of course, this is a man called Naftali Hertz Imber, who in 1877, two years before the word anti-Semitism is, is coined, writes the poem that became Israel's national anthem. And for some reason, he went back to that 37th chapter of Ezekiel and took that phrase, avdatik vatenu, and added the words odlo, odlo avdatik vatenu. And that, to me, is what Israel is about. It's about the proof that we should never give up hope. Now, you know what happened when they liberated Bergen-Belsen, because it's, it's on a recording that you can find on YouTube. The BBC sent a reporter and the survivors sing a song in, Bel in Bergen-Belsen. And you know what they sing? So for me, Israel is the power of hope to transform the world. The Jewish people kept hope alive and hope kept the Jewish people alive. Nowadays, in terms of the strategic threats Israel faces, there is a group that calls themselves BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions activists who campaign against Israel. Uh, would you share your views on them? Human rights are universal. So if you're going to defend human rights, or if you're going to protest an abuse of human rights, you have to do so universally. BDS singles out Israel and protests abuses of human rights, where it refuses to protest anyone else's abuses of human rights. That therefore is not human rights. That is a classic example of human wrong. I find BDS really, really lacking in any integrity. It is fundamentally aimed at the dismantlement of the state of Israel. It is deeply shocking. And because I care so much, um, I and, and, and my wonderful team of Joanna and, and Dan have put together some three little whiteboard animations. I don't know if you've seen them. One is on... I've the, seen them and we've, and we've shared them and we will share them again perhaps after this broadcast on our Facebook. Yeah, so, you know, I've done one on BDS, one on anti-Semitism and one on anti-Zionism. I, I think these are absolutely outrageous. Rabbi Sachs, uh, Israel and particularly Israelis are almost uniquely perhaps resilient. Uh, it's a nation that has had to hang tough like no other. Now, particularly in this time when we could all do with some resilience, what lessons can we learn from Israel? Well, number one, you know, as soon as all this is over, let's all go and remind ourselves what a great country Israel actually is. Number two, just look and what Israel has always been, it's an affirmation of life in the face of death. It was born after the Holocaust. It has survived 72 years of being surrounded by enemies. And every time there is a threat to Israel's security, somehow or other, Israel has found the ingenuity to turn that curse into a blessing or at least neutralize the curse. You know, when they were doing uh, lobbying missiles to get hospitals in the north of Israel, they simply built underground hospitals that could be taken underground in, in 24 hours. I've never seen anything like it. Um, we were impressed by the Chinese putting together a hospital in 10 days, but you know, China doesn't face the kind of dangers Israel does. Israel shows us you can be surrounded by enemies, you can be a tiny country surrounded by vast, vast uh, nations and empires and stretches of land, and yet you can still affirm life. And you could see how clear, firm, and decisive 
Israel's response was to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. It was very clear from the word go. Britain wasn't clear from the word go. The United States wasn't clear from the word go, but Israel was. And you look at how it's just taken 11 big cargo jets and flown them to China and bring back huge supplies. Somehow or other, when it's a matter of preserving and protecting and sanctifying life, Israel does these incredible things. But, but how do we learn this? Can, can I just give you a word of Torah? Because, you know, I am a rabbi, you know. Shvisha um, Pesach, you know, the seventh day of Pesach, we have the division of the Red Sea. Just before then, Israel has a battle against the Egyptians with all their chariots. And um, Moses says to the Israelites, you know, just stand there and watch God do it. He'll do it. You just shut up and he'll do everything for it. After Kriyat Yamsuf, they have another battle, this time against the Amalekites. This time, no miracles from God. Moses says to Joshua, go and fight Amalek. There are no miracles whatsoever. The Israelites, inspired by Moses, who lifts his arms up, they look up to the sky, they're inspired, and they win. Kriyat Yamsuf is that dividing point in history between the moment when God fights the Israelites' battles for them and the moment when the Israelites fight the battle for God. And that is the big dividing point. Our Kriyat Yamsuf was the Holocaust. And Israel is the Jewish people saying, I'm not going to wait for God to fight my battles for me. I'm going to fight his battles for him. And that is the source of Israeli resilience. We take our destiny into our own hands and we fight for Hashem. We don't wait for him to fight for us. I'd like to bring in some questions from our audience. Uh, this one comes from, uh, uh, here we are, uh, from Ian. He's saying, my wife and I have enjoyed reading your Haggadah, that's your Haggadah, uh, and are planning to host our first Seder. Uh, what advice do you have to engage our family who are more interested in their brisket dinner than Jewish texts and rituals? <laughs> I don't know. Look, I mean, first and foremost, um, you're going to get them all, please, to spill one extra drop of wine when it comes to the plagues, because we've just discovered the 11th plague. Second thing is you're going to discuss, you know, what it felt like to be in Egypt with all those plagues running around you. The Haggadah is, is always relevant because it's a very, it's a pretty political sort of text. And uh, the, the best way to do it is just ask everyone, if you can, just to prepare in advance one little three-minute thing on something that interests them. I mean, just to ask them to do it uh, without any forewarning is a, little, is a little difficult. But just say now, you know, could you just, Give, share with us one little insight. And I think that will spark a conversation and will get terribly interesting, actually. Uh, Jaron Treyer is saying, quoting your words back to you, he is saying, you once wrote in one of your books, faith is about seeing the miraculous in the everyday, not about waiting every day for the miraculous. What is the miraculous that we can see in this specific situation? Mm -hmm. I, I cannot believe that uh, history, destiny, the Almighty, or something saw things so precisely as to provide us with all these social media that allow us to connect ourselves to one another. If this pandemic had happened 10 years ago, we would be living in complete and absolute isolation. We, we wouldn't know what to do. The whole society would, would, would close down. Whereas in fact, and this is a grassroots phenomenon, all sorts of people are doing all sorts of creative things. There's a guy who's a personal trainer who's got, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of Brits doing half an hour's exercise with him every day. Um, also, you know, you've got a family who do a little bit of singing and apply Les Miserables to our present situation. I, in my book, was a little bit critical about the social media, but here it is. They have come at just 
the right moment. I think in many ways, um, this has happened at a moment where we should in any case have thought, are we going in the right direction as a society? And this is forcing on us reflections that couldn't have happened otherwise. I see everything about this is really quite miraculous. Miracles are sometimes very painful. Please be aware of this. Um, but I, I've rarely yet found a big event in my life or in the life of society that I couldn't extract some real meaning from. And if you want to know how to do this at any stage in your life, say, what has this thing that has just happened to me allowed me to do that I couldn't or wouldn't have done otherwise? And if you do that, you will find the hand of providence in your life. We have many Stamina students and high school leaders who are watching us uh, now, and they stand up for Israel on campuses all the time. Uh, what's your message for them? Oh, look, Israel. Israel. <laughs> There's so much wonderful about Israel. Um, and I mentioned this thing about going out on the balconies and so on. It's, it's so beautiful. But, uh, and of course, I don't live in Israel, so I, I don't see the miracles that are happening day by day by day. I get to. I'm blessed to. Pardon? Yeah. I get to see uh, the miracles every day. One little, little example. There's a singer in Israel called Yishai Rebo, who's just put on, a, on YouTube a uh, new song that he's composed during the pandemic called uh, Ketem Lucha. Have you heard it? I have, I have. Now this is a beautiful biblical kind of song, and yet relating precisely to what's happening, you know, in very elemental ways. He's talking about between Vayakel and Pekude and Vayikra and Sav. It's a very traditional thing. And then he's turning to Hashem and saying, you know, And etc. etc. So, you know, I, I think to myself, in what other country would I find a pop musician writing a deeply religious song in the middle of a thoroughly horrendous pandemic and lifting everyone's spirits? and getting their eyes to look a little upwards to heaven. I don't think that's happened in Britain. I don't think it's happened in the States, but it's happened in Israel. Rabbi Sachs, Natasha is asking, uh, anti-Semitism is a fight that we've always had to fight throughout my lifetime. Is this just something we will always have to battle? <sighs> it depends. Um, this is a very deep subject. I wrote a book about it called Not in God's Name. It's, a, it's not a very direct book because anti-Semitism as a direct phenomenon is, uh, is actually, it's a, it's a very deep phenomenon. I think a lot of it is deeply rooted in theology. I mean, anti-Semitism was not born with Christianity. He was born really with a guy called Manito, who was an Egyptian prince, a uh, priest in the third century BCE. You know that in Alexandria you had real, really the first deep modern type anti-Semitism. That then infected Greece and Rome and eventually Christianity. But Christianity was a major carrier of it. The truth is that has changed and it changed because a very great leader, Pope John XXIII, met a Jewish historian called Jules Isaac, a French historian, in 1960. Jules Isaac had written about the adversus Judeos literature in the early church fathers, the early anti-Semitic literature in the third, fourth, and fifth centuries. And the Pope realized he had to change the church, and he did. He didn't live to see it. 
He died in 63, it happened in 65. It was called Vatican II, Nostra Aetate. Today, Jews and Catholics meet as friends, having lived for 1800 years as, as at best strangers and at worst enemies. So, you know, it can be done. It needs greatness on the part of religious leaders to take us there. But um, there is absolute, I don't see anti-Semitism as an absolute given. I don't think there was a major history of anti-Semitism in China, and I don't think there was a major history in India either. And that's because neither of them was a Muslim or Christian country. We all have to wrestle. I mean, you understand, Michael, when, when I was saying to be free, you have to let go of hate. We're all capable of hating. Jews are, are as capable as anyone else. And we just have to fight it. And I would hope that there will be church and, and Muslim leaders who will fight it. I've certainly met people who do. So I am ho hopeful that we can get rid of it. But Jeremy Corbyn did not help. Absolutely. Well, let's hope we both dodged a bullet with that one. Uh, Robert is a high school student uh, in America, and he's saying, how do I explain my connection as a Jew to non-Jewish friends, even though they are not religious? I, I, I think Judaism, uh, and I know this for a fact, is really communicable without any theology at all because of that whole prophetic tradition. I mean, the story of Pesach is the supreme power intervenes in history to liberate the supremely powerless. You don't have to be religious to see this drama of freedom as a very powerful one. Uh, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah are talking about social justice. They're talking about caring for the vulnerable in society. These things have inspired people, whether they were religious or secular, because at the core of Judaism is a powerful morality. And that morality can be based on our humanity. You don't have to say this all came from heaven. All you have to do is say um, it comes from earth so long as we can see our fellow human beings as the image of God. In other words, it, Judaism isn't heavily theological. Does that make sense? It okay. does make sense. And in terms of his relationship to Israel, what would you advise somebody, a, a young Jew who's in a predominantly non-Jewish environment, how would you advise them to talk about their relationship to Israel? I think it's important for people to understand that Israel is where the Jewish people was born that uh, Judaism begins with two great journeys, Abraham and Sarah from one direction and then Moses and the Israelites from the other. It was there that they tr created a state, there that they created a language, there that um, the language, the landscape, the calendar, all of this is to us the place where I, our identity suddenly becomes coherent. It's no longer something locked up in my head. It's out there in the street. It's out there. I am in Jerusalem and I lift my eyes to the hills whence my Redeemer comes, etc., etc. Everything about Israel is Judaism made real. So, um, so just, you know, and, and I, I'm, it'd be hard to think of an example because if, if I were expecting a Greek to say, ah, the Parthenon in Athens, go and see that. That's, that's who I am. But yeah, that was 25 centuries ago, but Israel is just now as well as then. So Israel is where my people was born. Israel is where my people has been reborn. Well, we say, I think we'll have to wrap up soon, but I wanted uh, just to ask you, this situation we're currently in will end. We don't know how soon. Um, but it will end. When we when it does, what lessons should we take from uh, what has uh, we have all experienced collectively? Number one is our vulnerability. This tiny little invisible thing has brought all humanity to its knees. We should take our vulnerability more seriously. The climate change people have been telling us this for years. Guys, do not realize how vulnerable we are. I hope this will help us take more care of ourselves and our fellows and of nature. Number two, it has done something 
really, really important that Jews know all about, you know, because we believe Kol Yisrael Arevim is ever there. You can be scattered all over the world, but we know we're all tied to one another with bonds of mutual responsibility. This time for the first time ever, all humanity faced the same crisis, the same danger, the same anxieties, the whole of humanity. But I hope out of it will come some sense of Kol B'nai Adam Arevim Zebazeh, all of humanity, the covenant of global solidarity. And finally, as I say in my book, I hope we will come out of this realizing that um, if we really, really want to create the good society, if we really simply want to live through something like this, we have to focus on the we more than the I. I think um, out of this will come a sense that we have been through something terrible together. And there will be a sense of social solidarity such as existed immediately after the Second World War. And great things can then happen because people feel for one another and they say, let us build something new together. And before we go, uh, we at Stand With Us, we have a Haggadah. I know you have a Haggadah as well. My brother has a tradition that he gets a new Haggadah every year. So there's plenty of place on the bookshelf for multiple Haggadahs. Um, but our one is called From Ancient Egypt to Modern Israel. And with the artwork that we have within it and the quotes, it talks about that journey from Exodus, but not just that we left Israel, we came to Israel. We, not that we just we left Egypt, but we came to Israel. As we are in this very special time, Passover leading up to Israeli Independence Day, preceded, of course, by Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron, your reflections and final thoughts for our audience who are watching today. We on Pesach drink four cups of wine, corresponding to the four expressions of redemption, Botseti, Vitzalti, Vigalti, Velokachti, all in Exodus chapter 6. The only thing is, if you actually open Exodus chapter 6, you find that they're not four expressions of redemption. There are five. And the fifth one is, Verveti etchem el haaretz. I will bring you to the land. Why did we not say that? And why did we only have four cups of wine? Because we were in exile. In our lifetime, we have seen the fifth expression of redemption. And I hope, Michael, in Jerusalem next year, we will drink the fifth cup of wine on next year's Seder. I very much look forward to it. Thank you very much, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, for your words of chizuk, of strength, of comfort, and of course, of inspiration. I hope it's uh, not long. Maybe we won't have to wait till next year uh, mm -hmm. before we do that in Yerushalayim, the Shana Habab Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for being with us. Pleasure. Thank you, and we hope to see everybody viewing as well in Israel too. Our thoughts are very much with you. We hope you're well, and we send you our best tomorrow on Stand With Us Connect. We have an insider's view on Israeli politics. We'll be joined by Lakov Harkov, Lahav Harkov Levine, try saying that quickly. She's the senior contributing editor and diplomatic correspondent for the Jerusalem Post, also a proud Stand With Us fellow. She'll be talking on Israel's emergency unity government amid a health crisis. You can see the full program of Stand With Us Connect webinars. We have some unbelievable guests uh, coming up at standwithusconnect.com. If you love the work with Stand With Us, look at standwithus.com slash donate. And if you can support us, please do. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you next time. I'm Michael Dixon for Stand With Us Connect. Shalom from Israel.